reading is from Romans 8, uh, verses 18 to 27. Present suffering and future glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Amen. Let me pray for us as we begin this evening our sermon. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts in all our hearts be now and always acceptable to you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our short uh, sermon series on Romans 8 is taking us into one of the most wonderful passages in all scripture. If we were playing at Desert Island Discs with uh, Bible passage rather than music, and I know I'm showing my age, if you don't know what Desert Island Discs is, then ask someone or Google it. But this passage would surely be in most Christians' top 10 that they'd want with them on a desert island. But the danger we face as we look at Romans 8 is that we're being helicoptered in to this one chapter of Romans without having done the hard work of the first uh, seven chapters, as it were. It's a bit like uh, going up Snowdon on the mountain railway uh, and getting there without the effort and therefore not probably having the same appreciation of the summit as those who have walked all the way up, slogging the way up the footpaths. It's difficult to summarise the first seven chapters of Romans, and I know we're all at different points in our walk with God. Some here may, may not yet know him as their Lord and Saviour, and it's great that you're here to find out more. Please keep coming and listening with an open mind to God's word. But here are some of the questions that we need to keep in our minds uh, before us that have been raised by Paul in the previous seven chapters of Romans. Have we experienced the humiliation of seeing ourselves as lost and helpless sinners as Paul outlines in Romans 1? Have we fully understood that we face God's right anger, his wrath against us? And have we repented and come with faith to the precious cross, knowing that we've been justified, in other words, made right with God through trusting in Jesus Christ? And do we know that we're heirs of God because of that, for whom there is now no condemnation and that we therefore have no obligation to our sinful natures. These are some of the key challenges that Paul has been laying down and now he turns to the present experience of the Christian and an explanation of what we can expect from this life. We could perhaps uh, title this passage Christian Realism because set before us is a very honest appraisal of the bittersweet world in which we live. And Paul now gives two reasons why we can have absolute rock solid security in our future. Two reasons for us to persevere and to keep going and running the race with Christ. 
even when we're in the midst of despair and even when we're tempted to give up. Reason number one, no comparison. Verse 18, there is now, uh, sorry, I consider that there are present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. There's no comparison between our present sufferings and future glory. And then reason number two, which Adrian will be preaching on at our United service uh, next Sunday at 1030 in the morning. No separation. Verse 38. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So for today, Paul makes this frankly astounding statement in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul knew about suffering and perhaps now more than ever in recent generations. We perhaps now are not looking at our world with such rose tinted spectacles. COVID-19 is a dark fog for the whole world. Environmental challenges will soon rear their head as soon as COVID is solved, as it were. Then there's political instability. All of these pointing us to a broken world. The book of Romans that we're looking at doesn't paint a utopian dream of uh, where humanity is heading on its own. It's radically different to the uh, prevalent secular humanism, which we hear from social commentators, from teachers, from politicians and others. The assumption being that if only we can find a way of sharing the world's resources effectively, if only we can find a vaccine, if only we can elect a good leader, if only we can stay in Europe, leave Europe, if only we can stop global warming, then it will all be okay. And we'll rise to new heights of greatness on a virtuous spiral of human goodness and well-being. But it's just not true. History is largely a record of human suffering inflicted at the hands of other humans. And if anything, the suffering is getting worse, not better. I'm uh, watching at the moment a documentary called Berlin 1945. It's horrific what humanity uh, does against humanity. Now, this may shock you, but the Bible's diagnosis of humanity is sobering. Most people, most, uh, I suspect, if push came to shove, would say that humanity is inherently good with a capacity to do evil. The Bible puts it the other way around. It says that we are inherently evil, selfish, with a capacity to do good. That's the diagnosis of the human condition. Now, don't hear me wrong. Yes, alleviating poverty, searching for vaccines, providing better education, changing our habits on environmental issues are all vital. And it's often Christians who've been at the forefront wonderfully of those uh, projects. And it's lamentable when we haven't been. But Paul tells us that in our natural state, without God, humans are inclined to evil and selfishness, which of course goes some way to explaining the brokenness of our suffering world. And that things aren't going to get better if we continue to insist on our independence from God. So as we experience life now with all its suffering, we need to look forward to an event beyond ourselves. Have a look at verse 19, please. We are to look forward to nothing less than the liberation of creation from bondage. And while we read this little bit again, notice we're going to come, come to this. There are lots of groanings in our passage this evening. Lots of people are groaning. First, on a global scale, verse 19. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Do you see that? Creation is groaning. 
ever since Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, creation has been cursed. Genesis uh, 3 verse 17, if you're taking notes. We see it so often, don't we? Sometimes the link with humanity's sin is obvious, as when famine strikes in uh, war-torn countries like Yemen. Other times it's less obvious, as when an earthquake strikes. But Paul is pointing us back to the root cause, a creation cursed because of humanity's rebellion against God. Do we realise that creation is yearning for the day when it will be released from this bondage and frustration? And when we look at a sunset or a mountain range or a coral reef in all its beauty, we perhaps can't realise or imagine how infinitely more majestic and beautiful it will be when it's liberated. Think about it, what it will be like. We can't even imagine it. What will nature be like when it's free to produce and display what it was designed really to be like? free from pestilence and decay. How magnificent will those coral reefs, sunsets and mountains be when they're remade? But Paul also speaks of a second groaning, namely our groaning at a personal level. Verse 23, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. It's tragic and we can't explain it always. Why do so many terrible things happen? Why are friends and family here at All Saints and St Michael's and known to us suffering so much? Why is COVID-19 causing so much groaning? There aren't easy answers. Uh, Paul here in Romans won't give us a glib answer either. Certainly both Paul and Jesus, they both refuse to link such personal suffering to personal sin. There's no sense in which they deserve it. Rather, if anything, we should say we all deserve it. Because suffering in the here and now is the norm for humanity. And we Christians shouldn't expect to be exempt from it. I remember uh, reading a book called uh, The Man with the Key uh, Has Gone uh, by a guy called uh, Dr. Ian Clark. It's an amusing, it's a joyful, it's a, a heartbreaking account of his experiences as a Christian doctor working in post armin Uganda. AIDS was uh, rearing its ugly head. Uh, bureaucracy was uh, rife. That's the title of the book, The Man with the Key Has Gone, uh, is the excuse that is given by at every level of society as to why things uh, can't happen as they should do. And I remember being struck uh, by his viewpoint in this book, as I said a few weeks ago in another sermon, rather than just asking, why is so-and-so suffering? He found himself instead asking, why not me? Why am I not suffering? He came to realise that suffering in the here and now should be the expectation for all because we and all creation is groaning. And verse 19, subject to frustration. Friends, I know many of us are groaning at the moment. I can't possibly list or know your suffering, our suffering. But the Lord does. Because before we look on to the joy of Paul's message here, we need to notice that there's someone else who's groaning. And they're groaning with us. Verse 26. In the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with God's will. These are precious promises. Jesus promised and has given his spirit to be with us now. So as we struggle, we are actually really in tune with the spirit of God. I know it won't feel like it. But if we think that to be an authentic Christian, 
we have to be on cloud nine the whole time, leaping for joy, then we've actually got it wrong. The Holy Spirit, Paul says, will groan with us through our sufferings as we struggle in prayer, as we hardly know how to cope, as we wake up anxious about the things that we know are facing us, and as we go to sleep thinking about those same things, as we grieve and feel helpless. Friends, there are times when family and friends are so ill and the situation so desperate that I can't articulate words of prayer to God. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Friends, there are times for some of us now and ahead when we or loved ones are in hospital or care homes struggling with dementia, disability, cancer, with broken minds and bodies. And we won't even be able to issue a feeble cry in prayer. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. He understands, he helps, he secures God's approval of our feeble cries. In fact, we have two people interceding for us. I didn't notice this until this week as I was preparing. We have two people interceding for us, one in our hearts, the Holy Spirit, and another in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look ahead to verse 34. Christ Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Friends, we are greatly and deeply loved. So Paul doesn't provide uh, neat answers. What he does do is point us to the future. He calls us to look forwards, away from this present time, to a certain and wonderful future. Stop for a moment. Do you notice the kind of pain and suffering he links it to? Look back to verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. It's pain with a purpose. Now, I, I speak here only as an informed observer, but the pains of childbirth are a picture of what creation and we are going through. It's pain that's going somewhere. The birth of a child is good and creation is groaning, straining its neck, longing to the future, eager for the time of the glorious freedom of the children of God. The groans are evidence of the glory to come. That is the hope to which Paul points us in this passage. 99.9% .9 of the blessings of the Christian life are still to come and are ahead of us. We wait patiently, expectantly and confidently. That's what hope means. Verse 23, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The thing we groan for is the redemption of our bodies. In the parallel passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2, Paul cries out, for in this tent, meaning our bodies, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Paul means that we will finally and fully be conformed to the likeness of his son. In other words, we will be as perfectly holy as Christ and thus as dazzlingly beautiful as he is. That's glory. So verse 18, there really is no comparison. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glories that will be revealed in us. It's not just that the future is slightly better than life in the here and now, a bit like comparing a working day with a holiday. It's not that. Our future doesn't lie floating on the clouds of heaven. Our future lies in a fully renewed world with fully renewed bodies, redeemed bodies. So don't compare 
our present sufferings, which are very real and painful, to the glory that awaits us. We can compare a thimble of water with the ocean, but we cannot compare our present sufferings with the glories that will be revealed. Or to give you a, a trivial example, you can compare me as a footballer uh, with Harry Kane. And in the interests of uh, fairness, you should know that there are other good strikers at other good teams. I know there's a difference between me and Harry Kane, but we can still both kick a football. What Paul is saying here is that there is no comparison between our present sufferings and the glories to come. Don't be tempted to compare one with the other, however sharp our suffering becomes. And Paul tells us this to encourage us, to keep us looking forward. It's why we'll be able to say, uh, verse 28, which is the bridge into next week's passage, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Words of assurance, but that if we don't understand the context and Paul's future perspective can be misleading and disheartening. When in the here and now, things don't look good, but very bad. So as we put all this together, it amounts, I hope you'll see, to a survival guide. It really is OK to find life as a Christian difficult. God wants us to groan, to cry, to seek him, to pursue him. He wants us to do that and look ahead and to groan for glory, not to settle down here. And he loves us so much that he's given us his precious Holy Spirit to see us through. At times, we need to remind ourselves that the pain of being part of Christ's family in a world of frustration and rejection cannot be compared to the glory we are awaiting. Uh, the Christian Tim Keller, who we uh, listened to last week in our evening service, uh, wrote this. We know that we are not what we will one day be. We know that we do not already have what we one day will have. We know that all our best days lie ahead of us and that one day all our painful days will lie behind us we wait eagerly we wait patiently knowing that the pain will pass and that this life is not all there is that we have a glorious future that awaits us the glories of heaven are so stupendously unimaginably and eternally magnificent that it will have been worth the wait now, God, in his extraordinary sovereignty, as he often does, uh, Tim Butlin this morning when he preached for us at our morning service, finished his service with a Stuart Townend song uh, or the words of it. I'm also going to, as I've prepared, uh, read a Stuart Townend song, the words of which I'm going to finish with. Let me read this song. Maybe you want to pray it for yourself as I read it to us. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day, a glimpse of glory now revealed in meagre part, yet drives all doubt away. I stand in Christ with sins forgiven and Christ in me, the hope of heaven, my highest calling and my deepest joy to make his will my home. There is a hope that lifts my weary head, a consolation strong against despair, that when the world has plunged me in its deepest pit, I find the saviour there. Through present sufferings, futures fear, he whispers courage in my ear, for I am safe in everlasting arms and they will lead me home. There is a hope that stands the test of time, that lifts my eyes beyond the beckoning grave to see the matchless beauty of a day divine when I behold his face, when sufferings cease and sorrows die and every longing satisfied, then joy unspeakable will flood my soul, for I am truly home. Heavenly Father, please, by your spirits groaning with us, keep our eyes fixed on the glory 
of eternity with you. Through the suffering we face, may we never lose heart or hope. And it is through our Lord Jesus, who is interceding for us at your right hand, it is through him that we pray this evening. Amen. Before I go back to Jamie, who's going to introduce our final song. When you go into breakout rooms, if you stay for breakout rooms, if you'd like to do that at the end of the service, please can I encourage you to maybe talk to one another about two questions. What are you, what's causing you to groan at the moment? Because there will be things that are causing us to groan. And how will you remember the glory you're heading to? How will it transform your view of life? How will this hope that we've heard about tonight uh, transform our groaning? Thank you for listening. And uh, I'm gonna hand back to Jamie now to introduce our final song.